This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Barry Curry, who is the Director of Project Management for System E. Barry, how are you? Good, thanks, Terry. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. And, and I know we're going to be looking at why large software projects exceed budget on a regular basis. Can you give the listeners a bit of a background, Barry, of who you are? Yeah, so basically... Um... I'm a mechanical engineer by qualification, although that was about 25 years ago. Um, moved into project management over it was nearly 20 years ago of uh, manufacturing systems, mainly in life sciences manufacturing, but not, not exclusively. And uh, most of the work we do as an organization is bringing people on the journey from paper records for manufacturing to digital records for manufacturing okay. and all the business change that goes with that so uh, full sort of project completion end to end okay and 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 typically the t- typical size of business that you would work with body um it's all of the major players in life sciences so all of the fortune 500 top 10 life sciences uh, down to smaller startups uh, down to device manufacturers. So basically anyone who's involved in life sciences. And um, we're also working with a couple of software development companies that um, need some help getting their product to the market. Okay. And um, just helping them with the whole project aspect of that instead of it just being a product mindset. Interesting. So at the end of the day, the geeky technical person what you're doing is giving the hybrid that actually allows them to sell the product that they're actually developing or whatever. Yeah, so bringing a user's perspective to it. Okay, good, good. And and, and system me then, so, you know, would, you know, would you work with companies in the UK or is it predominantly in Ireland? No, it's it's Ireland, UK, Europe and US. Oh. Um, so we're not, uh, we're not bound by borders. Uh, obviously, we haven't been doing uh, direct work in the UK for the past uh, few months with the restrictions. But prior to that, we would have spent many years in the UK. Yeah. Good, good. And, and I think that leads us on to obviously what we're going to discuss in this week's podcast. So the topic this week is why do some, why do many large software projects exceed budget, take too long to implement and fail to deliver the expected functionality and business benefits? Um, give us a, you know, kick us off then, Barry, give us an insight into that. Yeah, so basically, if you, if you look across all industries, not just life sciences, and particularly sort of public sector, sector jobs, you'll see that, um, you know, software projects have a bad reputation for exactly that, you know, exceeding budget, uh, taking war, far too long to implement, and uh, probably not delivering what was expected of them in the first instance. And this is prevalent more so in life sciences because there are a number of big drivers for large software projects, generally business related. What would be a typical budget, Barry? Sorry to cut and I'm just trying to get an image in my yeah. head at size, at size of what that would be. Yeah, you know, you're looking anything from sort of the 200k mark up to the three, four million mark. Okay. And that would, most of that would be in manpower, you know, where uh, literally person hours, person days of delivery. Um, the, the software elements of it are actually quite small. The computer server elements of it are actually quite small. Okay. Right. Sorry, I cut it in there. I just wanted to get a vision in my head what we're dealing with. No, that's good. So basically, um, what we see is that um, from a to remain compliance with the latest regulations, the um, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies have to start to remove paper from their operations because it's inefficient. It introduces problems. It can introduce quality issues, and in extreme cases, you can have patient impacting events. Okay? You can have stuff like product recalls, something goes out to the market that shouldn't have, and they must do a recall. Okay. But this is all easier if it's electronic. You know, you can remove a lot of these issues, um, and that, that's the driver, rightly so, by many life sciences organizations to um, basically improve their quality, improve the supply of their product to the patient. And so what we see is that there's a a huge um, desire to jump into software testing as early as you can. Mm -hmm. And often that can lead to, uh, uh, you know, a lack of understanding of the actual requirements. So the last few major sort of jobs we've done, we've spent about 70% of the duration of the product on requirements gathering. And once you do that, the transition from closing off your design to testing is actually quite simple. The testing is quite predictable. 
and the go live and qualification is normally a non-event because it runs very smoothly because you put all the work in up front. But traditional software projects will start with a, a very large user requirement specification document written with best intent at very early days um, on a project when they understand probably about 90% of what they want. Mm -hmm. And once you close off that design, you're into the wonderful world of change control. And then everything is a big deal. So, so, so I'm just trying to relate that into something that would be relevant in terms of, well, for myself. So, like, it would be like building a race car. You know, I mean, you can start off with a manual, a document that documents every single piece of that process. Um, yeah. And then actually, it doesn't come to actually when you start to build it, you actually start to realise that the pipe should, the pipe's not going to go there. That like you need yeah. to put it somewhere else. So you need to put the electrical connector somewhere else and it just doesn't fit. So then... Yeah it's going to take more time and effort than rather than just getting it started and then working as you go. Is that, is, is that a good analogy? That's exactly, it's an excellent analogy, actually, because well, an important point to note is that, you know, it's not because of people's sort of lack of ability or intelligence or experience this happens. It's just often just enough time traditionally is not given to requirements gathering. Yeah. And particularly when you have so many moving parts in a large manufacturing facility, it's almost impossible to know exactly what you want at the very beginning. So what we do is we walk through a process of um, uh, requirements gathering, you know, prototype testing, requirements gathering, prototype testing, and then bring it all together. Um, but we spend a lot of time doing that. And, and often it's very difficult because um, the hardest part of it is convincing the client it's the right thing to do. Because what they always want to know is, Oh, when are we testing? <laughs> when are we testing the software? And we 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 do get the testing eventually, but it it, it does uh, introduce a large overhead of managing um, client, and we've managed to do that relatively well. Um, there's a lot of concepts we may introduce that are relatively new to life sciences because it's quite traditional and it's quite heavily dependent on standard processes uh, in terms of. Agile, we don't use the words agile, but we implement an agile process because sometimes with, when you talk about agile and scrums and so on, they, that can become the work, the jargon becomes the work. Whereas if you just focus on what you need to do, so we try and remove as much jargon from our conversations as possible and just focus on what will the users need from this system? What does the business need from this system? And everything works, everything stems from that. Okay, that makes sense. No, that's good. And, and I can kind of relate the client management piece to what I do as well. Obviously, recruitment, you know, people want the person hired yesterday, you know, and, and, it's, and, 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 I, and I get that. It takes a lot of, you know, time and effort. You want to do it right straight away. Uh, and that saves probably a lot of pain in the long term as well, doing the job right uh, and yeah. implementing that. Now, bring it on to, so it's obviously, you know, what we're discussing is, you know, why large software projects do exceed budget, you know. So what is, Barry, with your experience of doing this for 20 years or whatever, you know, what is the most common reasons for large software projects exceeding budgets and timelines? So one of them is, you know, because you don't spend enough time on your requirements, you spend more time in testing. And then they may have only, you know, budgeted for, let's say, a month's worth of testing. And I've seen a month's worth of testing turn into six months worth of testing. Yeah. And then once you're finished testing, you're into qualification. And because the testing didn't go too bad, you need to hold people back um, a couple more months to give people that comfort factor. You're going to be able to support them. That, that's one of the reasons. The other one is the failure to understand the implement the. Uh, impact of the implementation on the whole business, you know. So when you yeah, take a yeah. piece of paper out of operation, it's not just about that piece of paper, in, in, particularly in, in pharmaceutical manufacturing. That piece of paper will reference a standard operating procedure. It will reference another piece of paper. And they all have to be taken account of. And generally they all are, but often it's very late in the day. So you really need to bring all of the subject matter experts together from all of the different departments, and you literally walk through with whiteboards and post-it labels and brown paper across walls and so on, and into as much detail as you can, as early as you can, because you don't get it right first time. So if you fail to do that at the early stages, it gets flushed out during the testing, and then you'll see the testing is, um, you know, just like I say, 
one month to six months, and then your budget's just out of the water. And often with organizations is that they are so far down the road, they can't pull back now. So they have no. to keep going. And then there's a, you know, there's, there's a higher level of scrutiny on the budget on a daily, on a weekly basis. And that puts everyone under pressure because one of the, one of the challenges in, in industry in particular, when you're hiring a lot of sort of contract resources and people for temporary work, um, the focus becomes um, how many hours did I work this week, where the focus should really be what did we achieve this week to get to the end of the project. And it's bringing people onto that team, team sort of player mindset that we're on this together. We have an objective to go, you know, by the end of May or whatever it may be to finish this project. And, you know, it's difficult for people to get in, into the frame of mind that that may involve, you know, the odd late night here and there, not every time, but often if you spend two hours testing or working on something late one evening, that can save you a half a day the next day and, and so on. That's what I find is a big factor. So I would say... Like those ones, Barry, once you start it, it's just doing it, yeah. you know, and getting, getting that task done whilst if you're stop, start, stop, start, you know, you're just killing, res- um, you know, man hours straight away because you're having to get back into it and get an understanding. Exactly. And, um, you know, the testing then just expands into this monster. And that's that's normally where the, the symptoms of this are because, oh, it's, the testing is late, the testing is massively over budget, when in fact the whole project is. But this problem, the symptoms are a delay in testing. But the root cause was way back at the very beginning. Mm-hmm. And we're often called in to look at projects and programs that have gone horribly wrong. And there are no shortcuts. There's no magic. We just go right back to the start and we ask a simple question. Why is this project being done in the first instance? What are the expected outputs? And where did you expect to be now? We go right back to the start. And in a way, um, it's easier to see what went wrong. It's difficult when you're in the, the rush of a big project to see exactly what went wrong. But we can often provide that sort of fresh pair of eyes um, on a problem and just a, a neutral perspective. So we've no agenda other than just to help people. How, how would you, with your experience, how would you prevent cost spiraling, spiraling completely out of control? Because if, if I'm a senior leader within manufacturing and I'm interested in implementing something that's going to take the paper, uh, the paper documentation into uh, digital, you know, and I'm interested in that. But if I'm listening to this, my concern when we're talking about costs and spiraling, costs and spiraling timescales, my concern would be. Do I really want to do that right now as well? Yeah. Especially the way the economy is, the future of what that looks like is uncertain, but you know it's important for your business. Uh, how would you give that person reassurance, Barry? I suppose you can you know, look at what is the reason for it. Is the reason for it efficiency, allowing people to work remote from the operation now, which is obviously a big driver. Uh, we've seen, um, you know, talking to a number of companies in the last two weeks even, to say that, listen, we're, we're a plant that normally had 1,200 people on site. We now have 300 people on site and we're still running and we still have the same output. So what can we implement that will remove the need for that piece of paper to be circulated to five or six people? So there are real questions now. And um, so that's one part of it is, is why they want to do it. The other part of it is that because there's an increase in the, the activity of regulatory compliance and regulatory bodies around the use of paper records, um, it's getting harder to justify them. Mm. And they have to move. But I always encourage people to, you know, what gives most um, value for money as quickly as you can? Because people need to see results quickly. So instead of taking on a complete, you know, plant and every operation in the plant, you could take something like uh, an equipment logbook. So an equipment logbook is a physical book in most factories tell you um, uh, which holds all the maintenance records, operation records, any issues with that piece of equipment. So that's something that can be taken out very quickly. Yeah. Uh, you can empower the client to in- implement that across the board without too much disruption to the operation. And then they get used to the system slowly. It's a, it's a lower cost. It's a lower impact. And then you'll move on to something else like, you know, uh, many says um, there's a manual checklist. So we do this manual checklist on a clipboard, a piece of paper. Maybe we can just move that onto something like an iPad. They're doing the same thing through different media. So do it in increments rather than one big bang. 
and you know focus any of the main areas of um you need production downtime you need to get a schedule of uh, the shutdowns planned shutdowns in any factory will happen maybe twice a year sometimes once a year for a big one and you can keep them um you know that's when we do the disruptive work and by the time you come back up we'll be ready so you try and make it as seamless as can as you can you know Yeah, and, and and talking about the approach, then you mentioned uh, agile earlier, you know, and that might be a bit woo woo for them to listen yeah. because they might not know. Yeah, they'll, they'll have a, they'll have heard of agile before, um, but you know, what would you say for your experience? What's the most effective approach for software it's a blend project of implementation? Would that be waterfall or agile? You know, uh, requirements gathering, design, build, test, and qualify, and and for use, but. You can do it in an agile way, so you can get better use of the time. So to focus on small pockets, uh, do take one piece of uh, fun one function um, in a plant and do it end to end, improve the concept. So you're operating in an agile way, do as much testing as you can. And then when you have all the functions done, you bind them all together for one big test. Then when you know everything works, mm -hmm you can document and close off that design and test mm -hmm. properly in the waterfall way. So it's, it's a careful plan of both, depending on the situation, depending on the application. Mm -hmm. I always sort of adjust an approach to what's needed at the time and the urgency of what's needed as well, you know, because both approaches have their merits and their benefits and their challenges. And, and, and obviously, with you, most of your experience being within life sciences, you know, with that, an agile approach to project management. Yeah, I think and, once you, you adhere know, to the regulations, so they're quite such clear, as you know, and they're quite specific in terms of the order in which certain elements are approved. So you can do your, you can do an agile development and then validate it in a compliant way um, by signing off your documents. But using the sort of, the, one of the things I like about agile is that you don't have to um, yeah. lay your colors to the mass too early, you know that you're, you're building as you're going, you're learning as you're going, and you're feeding that in to the solution. So and often on the way to uh, to one solution, you, you learn the requirements of another and you sharpen the requirements of the whole system. But when you go to, back to the old, older sort of approach of just signing off requirements far too early, you don't have that flexibility. You know, So you're still compliant. So the way we've done it with life science organizations is that we will bring the quality of the validation people on the journey with us. We'll insist they're with us along the way. And so that we're building this compliance and quality into the design and showing them the benefits on their daily work as well, that it's not just a, a technical yeah. system, it's a business system. Good, good. And, and Barry, you know, you know, I think, you know, the whole purpose of this is, you know, bringing it back to point in terms of what we're discussing is obviously large projects exceeding budget, taking too long to implement, failing to deliver the expected functionality and business benefits. So how would, you know, you were touch, you know, we've touched on these snippets there, so we focus on that final piece of failing to deliver the expected functionality and business benefits, you know, you know, a big part of that would be expectations laid out from the start, the project being managed closely, client expectations managed closely, and then the project delivered successfully. Um, you know, when I, you know, coming back to if I was a if I was a business owner and I'm looking to sign off a, a large budget, say it's two million pounds, because what I'm looking to do is I'm looking to come out of what's going on at the moment. I'm looking to have. Uh, key members of staff working from home if they need to work from home, like commercial department, they don't need to be in the office, you know, they could work from home. And a benefit for me would have an everything on um, from, from obviously digitally, you know, it could be even just reporting, you know, just I can see reporting, I can see it. If I'm going on holiday for, holiday for two weeks and I want to check it at 12 o'clock in the airport, you know, whilst the kids are running around and I can check it and all that sort of stuff. But you know, I, you know, coming back to the the expected functionality of that, you know, is that something that's possible in terms of, you know, would that be, you know, the, yeah, an so overall project? Give me a view of an I overall mean, you project that people within manufacturing. Remotely. So a large amount of quality reviews in industry are still done on paper, you know, so a, a big 
bunch of documents arise on someone's desk and to, they have to go through them and check them. They might see a, a, a unclear handwriting that they have to check with someone. They look and see the guy who wrote that is off on holidays for the next two weeks, so we can't check that. So it introduces all these challenges. When you're changing someone's job from doing that into doing that electronically, you have to kind of walk them through it. So you have to get up these mock prototypes done as early as they can. And, I, and when I'm talking about a mock prototype, you know, I'm not talking about a fully developed solution. I've done it with screen flows on PowerPoints to make them mimic what the system would look like. So the person gets a real feel for what to expect. And then when they see it working in a, as an operational prototype, they know this is exactly, and they can give you the feedback saying, yeah, this is good. These two items are good. But you see this, this needs to be more prominent or this needs to be out here. So you, you very much get all of the users involved in the design so they know what to expect. So the goal live, the best result for us is that the goal live is an non-event because they've seen the system running that much in a, in a test or sandbox environment. There are no surprises. Whereas when you drop a system on a site to people and you haven't really given them any chance to input into that design, yeah. you know, their expectations are very different. You know? And therefore, yeah. value. Yeah. you say to someone, you know, this, because we, we, we did some work there recently and we measured before and after. So how long does it take you to do this work in the paper world? And then we measured, and now how long does it take in the electronic world? So if you don't have those measurements beforehand, you can't say how good it is afterwards in, in real terms. So, um, you know, you'll reduce a quality review from four hours to 20 minutes, for example. Um, and, and that's because we knew it used to take four hours beforehand. So what do I do with these three and a half hours I have now? You know, they can be you know, it's put to better purpose in the organization. And with regards to, so, so once that's all been implemented, I'm guessing there'll be tweaks getting done, stuff could be improved. Yeah, so typically there'll be, be hyper care. care but but what's the sort of aftercare the first package? Few weeks of operation, you know. Um, and then you kind of, so you, you define what that is. Do they need, is, is it a 24-7 facility? Do they need people there 24-7? Uh, can we train their people up to manage a certain level of support, you know, and then scale down support? So typically, um, but for the first few days of operation, I'd insist on having the technical expert as close to the system as possible. That is, it, it, sometimes it may not be a problem. It may just be an interpretation of a problem. And if, the, if you have the right people there to say, ah, that's fine, that was meant to happen, here's what the procedure says, let's move on. That is a very different thing than getting a phone call in the middle of the night to say, the system we spent two million on is not working. So, you know, and that's down to a relationship management um, element that you'd be yeah. doing all the way through the project anyway. And, um, you know, so that, that would generally be the approach. There will be a contractual obligation to support within a certain number of hours or days, of course, if, if it moves into that. But generally, if you have to refer back to a contract, you're in trouble. And I prefer to deal, uh, deal with people as informally as we can. And it, so far, it's worked out well. You know? Good. No, I 100% agree with that. And, and if I kind of summarise up in the simplest way, I you know that I'm trying I'm, I'm processing everything. So if we go back to the race car analogy, you know, at the end of the day, you know, when you're building mm -hmm. a, a big project such as a race car, you've got that finished product um, that's there. And that could be done in steps and stages. And what it's best to do is to kind of, you know, go, you know, plan effectively, but don't over plan and put too much time into that. And yeah. actually get in, you know, start making things happen, start bolting everything up together. And then weeks will need to happen. That can be done, which will save a lot more man hours than what it would be done just planning the project out from start to finish. Coming off, off the back of that as well, that can be done in its simplest form as well. It could be started off as a small uh, area of that. So it could be started off by, I don't know, the steering wheel, you know, for example, designing the steering wheel, making that functionality, making all that proven. And then no, that can go and in the same way, you know. Just, I'm sorry, I'm doing this, Barry, but it's just kind of getting it clear in my screen, head. He doesn't have any concerns. It's the same thing, you know. Correct. And 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 the reality is, you know, once that product's finished, you know, 
it's, it's not as if it's came to an end because that could be tweaked and improved, you know, such as, I don't know, yeah. the front wing of a Formula One card, you know, that'll always change, it'll always improve, you know, and, and, and what you've got is a design team focused on that one part of it, you know, that's 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 involved in it and integrated in it that mm-hmm. wants to develop that in the best way possible, which would be the staff within the site. Um, but coming back to what we're actually doing is what we're doing is we're taking a, a, a manual paper-based system currently that could be completely digitalized that's going to make the make a manufacturing site life sciences business more productive because they'll have the relevant information on hand quicker, better, yeah. more effectively, and they can communicate with their yeah, senior that, that's leadership it. And and the staff the on site goal here more is effectively. Would that be a good summary? You know, that's the ultimate thing. So, you know, one standard we have on the team is that have you done the best you can do today? You know, would you take this product yourself if you were sick? And that's, that's the ultimate test. And, you know, that's why all the standards are in place is for patient safety. And that that's a driver for us. Uh, as a group of people as well, you know, we take that quite seriously. Good, good. And, and Barry, if, if a, you know, a listener's listening to this programme, going, do you want to know what? That was really, really interesting. I'd be inter- interested to find yeah, out Yeah, you can contact us a number of ways. How would you reach out to yourself? Way. How would you um, get in contact Barry with at you? System.ie. That's uh, Barry at um, S-Y-S-T-E-M-E dot I-E or on Twitter at Projects Doctor. Um, there's also a, a general email, projects at systeme.ie. Yeah. So a okay. number of ways you can contact us. Okay. And and just to, so so just to clarify, you know, you know, you know, you would be open to discussions whether it's a 10 million turnover manufacturing business mm-hmm. in the UK to a, you know, Two three hundred million uh, turnover life sciences business yeah, based in no, Ireland. You know, it's, it's, I mean, it's you know, last all, year we were uh, called into help. That'd be right. Uh, I was on a, a blog that blog uh, we'd written. Uh, we were called in and contacted by a client in the US to help them with the response to the FDA around the observations on a one billion dollar facility. Um, so you know that was a, a small body of work over a few weeks, but it was quite serious because it was preventing them from basically starting manufacturing. Um, and, you know, that came from a contact we had over one of the blogs we'd written. So it's, it's a full range and we don't um, compromise uh, no matter who we're dealing with to get the same um, same service, you know. Good, good. Well, Barry, thank you very much. Very, very useful, very helpful. And hopefully some of our listeners will actually listen to that and actually think, do you want to know what? Maybe as time I move from paper based into digital and actually come into the you know the real world um in terms of where I've been. No, it's very well, anyway. Terry, absolute um, pleasure. But, no, thank you very much, Barry. I really appreciate uh, that. Refine it down to something very easy to explain. Thank you very much indeed.